السلام عليكم دي اول محاضره ان شاء الله للمقرر النيوناتولوجي هنتكلم عن البيرث انجري Birth injury is an impairment of the infant's structure or function due to adverse influences that have occurred during birth. ممكن ال birth injuries بتكون antenatal, intrapartum, or happen during resuscitation. It may happen despite the competent obstetric care. Other injuries may be latent initially and then they result in severe sequelae afterwards. What are the factors that predispose to a birth injury. First, if we have a mother that has primal gravida, if she's short, if she has maternal pelvic anomalies or cephalopelvic disproportion, if the labor was prolonged or rapid, if we have oligohydramia, an abnormal presentation. Sometimes the usage of um, forceps or instrumental delivery may predispose to a birth injury. If the baby is a very low birth weight infant or he's extremely premature, if he has a fetal macrosomia or a big head, and fetal anomalies, if this baby has, um, let's say, um, any of the neural tube defects, if he has problems adding carefully or um, masses. Let's have a close look on the picture of the skull. First, we have the skin. Um, I'm trying to work with the laser pointer. Yes, here we go. We have the skin. And then we have a layer of the galia, or the aponeurosis, the fascia. And then we go here to the periosteum, which is the lining over the bone. And then there is the bone, or the skull. And there is toward the layers of the meninges. To understand the different birth injuries, Concerning the skull, you'll find that the caput starts here. It is under the skin, just beneath the skin. The cephal hematoma, it is subperiosteal lesion that we find that it does not cross any bone. It does not cross the midline. And here's the subgallial hemorrhage, which is under the fascia or the gallia aponeurosis. So starting with the caput sexpenium, it's a diffuse sometimes ecumotic, edematous, extraperiosteal swelling of the soft tissues of the scalp, involving the portion that presents during labor. It may extend across the midline and across the suture lines, and I will show you by picture now. The edema disappears during the first few days of life. You do not need to start any treatment to your patients. You just reassure the patient that it's a temporary lesion that will resolve by the picture. We find that the caput, it extends, it crosses the midline, it may take more than one bone. On the contrary, we find that the cephal hematoma is a subperiosteal hemorrhage. It usually follows instrumental delivery. It is limited to the surface of one cranial bone and it does not cross the suture line. It's usually in the parietal region. It happens due to rupture of the blood vessels that traverse from the skull to the periosteum. Large cephal hematomas may occur with vitamin K deficiency, and, and uh, you, you all know that vitamin K injections are routine after the birth of the baby. There is no discoloration of the ovary lying scalp. The swelling starts after several hours after birth. Sometimes we can find an underlying linear skull fracture that is associated with the cephal hematoma. It takes around from two weeks to three months to be resolved longer than the caput, of course. No treatment is needed, it self-resolves, unless this patient goes into um, hyperbilirubinemia and may need phototherapy or, or other maneuvers to reduce the bilirubin. Other complications include infection and calcification of the hematoma. of the skull. It may be a linear skull fracture, and those are the most common that cause no symptoms and require no treatment. They have the depressed fractures, and this is usually due to a force of delivery, and it requires an immediate neurosurgical contact. The subgallial hematoma 
is the bleeding of the potential space between the sculptured ostium and the regalia of the neurosis. It results from a vacuum applied to the head of the and the diagnosis is usually a clinical one. We find this patient with a fluctuant bulky mass that develops over the scalp and especially over the occiput. It develops gradually, 12 to 72 hours after delivery, and increases gradually and may be sometimes noted immediately in severe cases just after birth. The hematoma spreads across the whole calvaria, and the swelling sometimes may obscure the fontanelle and cross the suture lines, and this distinguishes it from cephal hematoma. Sometimes those patients, if this hematoma is severe enough, it may cause a hemorrhagic shock and subsequent hyperbilirubinemia due to the hemolysis that occurs. In the absence of shock or intracranial hemorrhage, the long-term prognosis is generally good. What about the management? It is just vigilant observation to detect the progression and to provide supportive therapy if some problems pop up like shock and anemia. Transfusion and phototherapy may be necessary. Investigations for coagulopathy may be needed. The subconjunctival and retinal hemorrhages are frequent the petechia of the skin of the head and the neck. Now, take a close look on that x-ray, huh? Do you find where's the, where's the problem? Yes, this is exactly the problem. We have a fractured clavicle. It's the most common fracture during labor. It's usually green stick and occasionally a complete fracture. It's caused by a difficult shoulder delivery in the vertex presentation or extended arms in brief. The clinical picture is that this patient cannot move this arm. You can find pain on passive movement. I cannot elicit the moral reflex on that side, so you'll find it one of the causes of an asymmetric moral reflex. We find precipice over the clavicle, and it may present with a callus if it just um, heals improperly by a palpable mass that denoted at the age of one to two weeks. Um, can this callus uh, press on the, um, on the lung and cause respiratory distress? This is sometimes happened, but rare. The x-ray confirms the diagnosis and the treatment is just by immobilization of the arm for the seven to 10. Fractures of the humerus and the femur may happen. We find that the more reflex is absent on the affected extremity. The traumatic lesions associated with brachial plexus injury include the following. Fractured clavicle in 10%, fractured humerus, subluxation of the cervical spine, cervical cord injury, and facial palsy. Look at this poor little baby. He found, we'll find um, look, look at the position of his arm. It's private. The brachial plexus injury is either Erb's palsy or complex paralysis, or the paralysis of the whole arm. Erb's palsy happens when there is an injury of the cervical root, the fifth and the sixth. And we find that there is. <coughs> Sorry. We find that there is failure of abduction of the arm, and um, he cannot supinate the forearm. So the characteristic position of that arm is that it's adducted, it's internal irritated, and it's pronated. We find that the biceps and the moral reflex are absent on that side. If the lower roots, six and seven, are fine, you'll find that the grasp reflex is intact because it's it, the herbs. Um, impairs the arm, not the hand. The management consists of prevention of the contracture. We immobilize the limb gently across the abdomen for the first week and then start some passive range of motion exercises at all joints of the limb. If there is no improvement, we'll have to consult a neurosurgery. Complex paralysis is a rare injury. It happens to C7, C8, and C1 and it produces a paralyzed hand with an absent grasp reflex. If the sympathetic fibers of C1 are involved, you will find the symptoms of Horner's syndrome. You will find ptosis and meiosis, 
on this side of the injury. The phrenic nerve paralysis involves the injury of the cervical roots of C3, 4, and 5. And this is usually unilateral. It's mostly associated with herbs, or it may have been isolated. Approximately 80% of the lesions involve the right side, and 10% are bilateral. The cause is biphasic because the infant initially experiences respiratory distress. With all the signs of respiratory distress, the patient starts with tachypnea and the signs of respiratory um, retraction, uh, the intercostal retractions in the flaring of the alienid eye. And then the blood gases start to be suggestive of hypoventilation by the hypoxemia and the hypercapnia and the resulting acetosis. And over the next several days, the infant may improve with oxygen in varying degrees of ventilatory support. An elevated hemidiaphragm is observed in the late stages, and the diagnosis is confirmed by ultrasound or fluoroscopy of the chest. It reveals an elevated hemidiaphragm and a paradoxic movement of the affected side. Here is the elevated hemidiaphragm, and we find some CISO paradoxical movement of the affected side because both sides do not work synchronously. So we find that there is a problem on the right side and the left side is working. So it's like a CISO. So you get a lab and you have to do it. You have to do it in the same way. You have to do it in the same way and you have to Treatment is non-specific. We position the patient on the affected side. We give him some supplemental oxygen plus minus mechanical ventilation. We give antibiotics in case of pneumonia. And diaphragmatic plication is requested if there is no improvement in one month. The facial nerve injury results from pressure over the facial nerve in utero, from efforts during labor, from forceps during delivery, and is rarely due to nuclear genesis of the facial nuclei, for how does the brain stem. When the infant cries, we find that there is no, no movement on the paralyzed side. On the affected side, we find that the forehead is smooth, the eye cannot close completely, what we call the lack of thalamus, and the nasal labial fold is absolutely He can't close his eye on the right side. There is no nasal labial fold, but like the one you can see on the left side, and there are no wrinkles on the forehead. This is a case of right-sided facial nerve palsy. Sternomastoid injury shows in the patient by a well-circumscribed, fusiform, palpable mass in the mid-portion of the sternomastoid muscle. It may present at birth, but more often at one to four weeks. The etiology is uncertain. It may be due to abnormal intrauterine positioning or, an hyper, or a hyperextended muscle during labor. This leads to rupture, hematoma, and fibrosis, and the subsequent mass that we see. Well, what do we do to the patient? We usually reassure that patient, and it usually disappears by itself within three to four months. Some patients do need some physiotherapy um, by repeating the maneuver and turning the head on the affected side. The visceral injuries that may happen during the birth, the liver may, be, may rupture, um, and this, of course, leads to all the complications of bleeding, like tamponade. The infant appears normal in the initial one to three days, and there are non-specific signs related to a loss of blood, like poor feeding, irritability, pale patient, his jaundice due to the hemolysis of the hematoma, his tachypnic, tachycardic, and then we may find a mass in the white hypochondrium, and sometimes the abdomen may appear blue, the hematoma may be very large enough to cause anemia and subsequent shock and death. Sometimes with the, with the hepatic um, subcapsular hematomas, splenic rupture may be as I will not go further in the intracranial hemorrhage because as I found Dr. Nayira, um, she gave you the lecture quite uh, more detailed. So I'll just say that intracranial hemorrhage may be epidural, subdural, subarachnoid, 
It may occur when there is cephalopelvic pelvic disproportion, prolonged labor, breech delivery, or a mechanical interventions, just like the predisposing factor we started in the beginning of the lecture. Asphyxia, thrombocytopenia, DIC, vitamin K deficiency, other bleeding tendencies, muscular malformation, all may result in hemorrhage.